Okay, so let's just begin this. I'm going to go through each of these flashcards quickly because this covers basically the main points, all the main points that you need. And in a glance, I think you can take in everything. Like within a minute or two, you can know, within a few seconds, you should be able to uh, take in everything important so that when you go back to studying, it will take you uh, like a very few uh, minutes to study the whole chapter. So let's go through this. The first topic that was done by Prashan was osteoarthritis. Now he went into a lot of detail, but basically this is just a summary. So first, osteo means bone. Arthritis is inflammation of the joints. So in this condition, we have mechanical wear and tear. So as the uh, joints rub against each other, there's going to be mechanical wear and tear. And over time, there's going to be inflammation. Uh, like when you cause friction between two surfaces, like if you do this, there's going to be friction, there's going to be inflammation, and then basically there's going to be damage. And in osteoarthritis, or it's going to go on with poor repair. Like there's going to be poor repair and the formation of these bony processes. These are called osteophytes. So you should be able to understand what are the risk factors. Old age, then females. And if you're obese, you put a lot of stress on the bone. And then repeat trauma if you are a runner. Let's say you run a lot. Your knees especially are at a high risk of developing osteoarthritis. So let's take a look at this condition. There's going to be asymmetric joint involvements. The joints are not going to be symmetrically affected. That means if uh, your shoulder is affected, it's going to be this shoulder and probably the leg. It's not going to be both shoulders at once. That's what you mean by asymmetric joint involvement. And the more you use, the more the pain increases and it fills with rest. That's what's said here. Then I know that we talk about these nodules in the DIP and the PIP. Sorry, PIP and the DIP. Uh, it's important to know which disease they are talking about when they mention these. So in rheumatoid arthritis, you get they define it as mainly nodules in the PIP. In osteoarthritis, you get nodules both in the DIP and the PIP, and these are called Bouchard's and Hubbard's nodules. You can see. In psoriatic arthritis, it's the DIP. So if you see a question that says just one of these, then uh, it will help you clue into the answer. And here are the, risk, uh, the treatments. You, you, if there's pain, you give uh, NSAIDs. If needed, you can give intra-articular corticosteroids. That means you can inject corticosteroids if there's uh, pain in a single joint. And there are surgical options to help. This was done by Prashant. Yeah. If you have any questions, please ask. Okay. Next, we have the other type. That is rheumatoid arthritis. This is an autoimmune destruction of the joints. That's the main point. And there are multiple organs involved. The main thing I want you to understand is, in this case, there's symmetrical joint involvement. So let's say these are the antibodies which have come and attached to the joints. They're going to cause inflammation. And when you move, these antibodies will get lodged, will get dislodged. Think of it like that. So the pain improves with use. When you, when you wake up in the morning, you have something called morning stiffness. And with use within one hour, it will usually go away. And there are systemic symptoms such as fever, weight loss. In osteoarthritis, you don't have those. Again, there's elevated CRP, ESR, rheumatoid factors. These are all autoantibodies. And very importantly, the most specific one is this anticyclic citrullinated peptide antibody, it's called the anti-CCP antibody. Okay. And I, I, have, I know someone who has rheumatoid arthritis. Their hands are like this. Uh, that person's hand is like this. It's stuck in this place. That person has to pick a pen 
she's used to it like this she can't move the fingers beyond this point because there are those nodes these nodules so uh, this swan neck deformity radial drift ulna deviation and subluxation of the wrist like it's slipped this is a typical hand of a person who has rheumatoid arthritis and these no nodules they are found in the mcp pip and not the dip okay when i say not the dip just use this okay understand that and the treatment you need to give methotrexate as soon as possible and not nsaids for pain and then there are dmards and other drugs which you use to slow the progress basically this is some not something you can treat yeah so that's rheumatoid arthritis in gout what happens is they uh, if you eat a lot of nucleic acids that is present in every food but mostly it's present in large numbers in protein that means in animal protein if you love to eat meat if you are a heavy drinker all of these let's take a party person who is just all the time eating meat male obese they are at a high risk of gout and what happens is these monosodium urate crystals they go and enter the joints and usually at night when it's cold at the most cold regions of our body like in these regions especially the big toe there's very less blood supply so there's less heat there that is going to cause these crystals to crystallize causing an acute flare up it's called an acute flare up and with time there's going to be damage and development of these tophi which is called tophaceous gout this is a this is a chronic process and also this condition can uh, because there's high amounts of uric acid it can lead to uric acid stones in the uh, kidneys and very importantly there is a drug which you should remember thiazide diuretics because they are diuretics what they do is they are going to put all the water out causing the uric acid concentration to increase in the kidneys and in the blood so that is a very important risk factor you need to know and you can do this aspiration and under fluorescent light you will see these crystals okay if it's needle shape it's gout if it is shaped like this it's calcium pyrophosphate early it was called uh, pseudo gout but calcium pyro pyrophosphate is the current name that they use calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease okay and uh, one more thing this mainly goes and deposits in the knee knee joint then the treatment if a patient complains of uh, uh, an acute flare up pain swollen uh, joint and if you give them a non steroid anti inflammatory drug or corticosteroid they will say that the pain went away very quickly they will be like okay immediate relief of pain within 30 minutes they're fine so remember that that's a very important thing uh, these medicine act very quickly and bring about rapid pain relief but then long term you don't give these patients corticosteroids it's not good for them you need to give them anti xanthin oxidase inhibitors such as allopurinol febuxostat and then there are other drugs like peglotikase probenecid so these are the drugs which you give long term okay for pain for immediate pain give a non steroid anti inflammatory drug colchicine or corticosteroids then we talked about a group of four syndromes called pair psoriatic arthritis and kylosing spondylitis inflammatory bowel disease associated arthritis and reactive arthritis these are called zero negative arthritis because they do not have rheumatoid factor okay they don't have rheumatoid factor which is seen in 
rheumatic uh, rheumatoid arthritis these are called zero negative and rheumatoid factor is an igm molecule it's an auto antibody of igm which goes and attacks igg molecules okay that is a very important thing you need to know what is rheumatoid factor it's an igm auto antibody that goes and attacks igg and this is hla b27 gene related it's a mhc1 related condition so if a patient who has a problem with the gene also develops skin psoriasis this is also an autoimmune condition this is also a, it's a skin disorder if they develop skin psoriasis then they are at a very high risk of developing psoriatic arthritis that is joint involvement with pain so there are some extra findings which you need to know in the dip we talked about this in the first slide it's called pencil and cup deformity and there are some nail changes onycholysis so you need to treat the psoriasis uh, this is modifying anti rheumatoid drugs corticosteroids on steroidal antibodies uh, sorry um, nsaids this is the main treatment for almost all the conditions we are going to talk about okay then we have ankylosing spondylitis in this case the joints of the vertebrae start fusing you can see this fusion happening there's going to be inflammation here and then gradually they will start to fuse this is called the bamboo spine deformity and they will also that will lead to when uh, it's fused the patient will be stooping like this there are some very important things you need to know this is common in men aged usually young men around 35 the word men is very important it's a majority of patients are men and there are some other uh, associations such as uveitis inflammation of the uvea then aortic regurgitation and then sacroiliac joint fusion the most important thing is this bamboo spine this joint fusion can cause restrictive lung disease so the person can't breathe because these vertebrae they are not moving up and down by uh, uh, inhalation so the way you monitor this disease is by monitoring the lung function that is a very important thing you need to know also again this is zero negative no rheumatoid factor treatment is mainly exercise an ibd associated arthritis it's uh, crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis and these patients will have joint pain there's nothing else to say about this when you treat the crohn's disease or the ulcerative colitis the arthritis episodes will also go down then we have reactive arthritis so p a i r reactive arthritis this is very similar to gillian barr syndrome so in gillian barr it's uh, paralysis from bottom up after an infection usually the causative agent for gillian barr is also campylobacter okay campylobacter is associated with causing gillian barr syndrome same thing here you have an infection these are all gi infections your senior pestis uh, lyme disease with chlamydia it's a zero negative infection if you know um, what do you call gynecology you know that chlamydia doesn't show up on um, the culture reports it's a zero negative there's nothing uh, this yeah it's called the zero negative the other one is neisseria gonorrhea those are zero negative and a few weeks later you get three things uveitis inflammation of the uvea then arthritis in the large joints and urethritis those three together reactive arthritis treatment you need to make sure that you treat the infection and then you need to treat these inflammatory symptoms and then there is the topic back pain 
So what causes these back pain? Is it, if a patient complains of back pain, what could be the cause? The way you check that is, we have one, two, three, four, five, six causes here. If it is an infection, if it is vertebral osteomyelitis, we are talking about back pain, so it's about the vertebra. They will complain of things like fever, night sweats, and focal tenderness, point tenderness. That is how we know it's vertebral osteomyelitis. If it is due to spinal stenosis, that means the spinal canal has if this is the spinal canal where the spinal cord goes through, if there's narrowing of that, then it is going to cause pain when you are extended. Like when you're standing, it causes pain. And when you move forward, when you flex, the pain goes away. It's spinal stenosis. Then you have radiculopathies such as disc herniation. This pain radiates to the leg. And when you lift the leg, there's going to be pain, positive straight leg test. Then if there's spinal metastasis, the complaint will be constant pain, worse at night. And even if you change position, there's not going to be pain relief. Then there's this uh, ankylosing spondyloarthritis, spondyloarthropathies, uh, pain with rest, but exercise relieves it. Rheumatoid arthritis, spondyloarthropathy, both of those. Then you have degenerative osteoarthritis. Pain with movement, rest, resolves the pain. So those are the differential diagnoses of back pain, which you need to know. Next, we have osteoporosis. Uh, usually, the main cause of osteoporosis is low estrogen, because you need estrogen to build bone. So as you grow older, after menopause, especially in females, they will have low estrogen. And that increases the bone breakdown. Also, remember drugs like corticosteroids are a huge cause of bone destruction. So there's going to be vertebral fractures, hip fractures, and when they fall down, if they fall down, they can have wrist fractures. And one diagnosis method is you do a DEXA scan, if the T-value is less than 2.5, minus 2.5, that's osteoporosis. Remember, there's no elevated labs. When I say labs, the calcium levels, phosphate levels, alkaline phosphate levels, those are normal. And when you give these patients bisphosphonates, you need to make sure that these patients stay standing because uh, bisphosphonates damage the esophagus and the stomach line. You need to make sure that the person can stay standing. So if they are bedridden, you don't give them the oral form. If they have gastroesophageal reflux disease, you don't give them bisphosphonates. So the two drugs that you need to know mostly are alendronate and resendronate. Okay. Dronate, D-R-O-N-A-T-E. That's the that's how you know it's a bisphosphonate. So there are other drugs, steriparatide, calcitonin, denosumab. We have talked about this. Osteopetrosis is when osteoclasts are made on the bone. So this is a normal x-ray. But in osteopetrosis, they can't produce the acidic environment that you need to break down the bone. This leads to a hard bone. You can see whenever there's a lot of calcium, it's going to shine bright, okay? And when the bone marrow area is also infiltrated by the bone, there's going to be reduced uh, blood cell production, there's going to be pancytopenia. And when the bones become bigger, there's going to be nerve impingement, there's going to be like the nerves are being compressed, which leads to uh, nerve palsies, okay? The treatment, since the osteoclasts are derived from monocytes, you do a bone transplant. That's usually curative. Osteomalacia, it's the adult form of rickets. Vitamin D deficiency. That's the main thing. Okay. Vitamin. 
Paget's disease of bone, also a very important topic. And you can't Trying the bone. And then, hello? Hello? Can you hear me now? Okay. So in Paget's disease of bone, the osteoclasts get activated and they start to destroy, give me a second. So they start to destroy the bone and then the osteoblasts come and they start to build the bone. So with time, the osteoclasts, they stop and the osteoblasts take over. And in the end you get this lamel, Pose trabecular pattern. This is a very defining statement of bone. So in the skull, <laughs> you can see the skull thickens. And a common complaint is hat size has increased. This is a very common complaint. Okay. And there's obviously because uh, if there's uh, bone growth, especially in the ear, there can be hearing loss. And this fact is very important. The only thing that's elevated is ALP, calcium levels, phosphate levels, those are normal. Okay. Next, we have systemic lupus erythematosus. This is a big topic, which has a lot of things. The main things I have included. First of all, uh, there's going to be this photosensitivity. The patient will be sensitive to uh, light and there's going to be, whenever they are exposed to the sun, they are going to develop this mala or discoid rash. Remember both names. There's going to be like a butterfly rash. Then they have neurological problems. They can have seizures. They can have uh, confusion, different neurological symptoms. Then this, they can develop painless ulcers on the tongue. Then very commonly, they develop valvular th thrombi on both the top and the bottom surfaces of the mitral valve and the aortic valve. Uh, remember that top and bottom. I drew it. If you can see clearly, top and bottom move commonly in the bottom. So that's why I drew move in the bottom. And it's called Liebman Sachs endocarditis. And always, always, one of the most common cause of death is renal disease most commonly diffuse proliferative uh, GN, glomerulonephritis. And there's always one, uh, at least one cell line has gone down. Anemias, when I say anemias, I don't only mean red blood cells, at least one cell line is reduced. Then there's going to be immune complex deposition. So immune complexes come and deposit and you don't have the complement system to remove those. Okay. The, that's the main uh, pathogenesis of lupus SLE. So there are some uh, autoantibodies you need to know. There's the ANA, anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, anti-Smith. These two are very specific. Anti-phospholipid, and then you have low levels of complements, these complements. Now, Patients who have SLE, females who have SLE, obviously this is more common in females, they have a risk of giving birth to a child who has lupus. When they're born itself, they have lupus. Another disease associated with neonatal lupus, you need to know, is Sjogren's, okay? Both of these. And if a child has lupus, you know that the child is going to get this condition that is complete heart block congenital complete heart block and the child will be on pacemaker for life. That's a very important thing you need to know. Treatment, hydroxychloroquine for all patients. Uh, then this is modifying agents, uh, CD20 drugs, then neutrophil inhibitors. Uh, if you learn biochemistry, you know that this inhibits synthesis of nucleic acids, especially in neutrophils that uh, stops uh, the cell's division and uh, it yeah 
the immune cells are what's causing the autoimmune disease. Then we have dermatomyositis and polymyositis. Dermatomyositis involves the skin. Polymyositis involves just the joints, uh, the muscles. Myositis is inflammation of the muscles. Poly means multiple. Dermato, skin, muscles, inflammation. So polymyositis is mediated by CD8 plus T cells. If, okay, if I wrote it in this color, in this pink color, that means it's common for both. Okay, I need you to understand that if it's in uh, this color, it's common for both. <laughs> but if it is in like this part over here, this green, that means it's common, on, it only happens in that disc. I have used it several times. Dermatomyositis, it's a CD4 plus related, and you get this dirty rash. It's called the dirty rash of the face, and this region. And the complaint is they have difficulty lifting their arm to, uh, over their shoulder. Okay? Proximal muscle weakness. The word proximal is very important. And guys, we don't have the Zoom Pro account yet. Uh, when we start the next module, we'll purchase it again. After 10 minutes, I will send the link again. Or oh, yeah, I will send the link again. The autoantibody is related to this. Uh, ANA and anti jo one anti-signal related peptide 1, anti-MI2. Then we have Sjogren's syndrome. Sjogren's syndrome is, think of it as a disease mainly affecting this region, the facial region, where they have dry mouth, uh, they are not producing saliva, and they are not producing tears. So they have dry eyes, dry mouth. This is also an autoimmune disorder. And because of the dry eyes, it can cause keratoconjunctivitis sicca. Uh, that's okay. Then uh, dry mouth, uh, you don't produce saliva. And in patients, they can have bilateral parotid enlargement. Like the parotid gland is going to get enlarged. This is all because of lymphocyte infiltrates. There is going to be, if you do a biopsy, you will see a lot of lymphocytes and that increases the risk of lymphomas. Okay. Then uh, these are the autoantibodies which are positive. SSA, SSB, rheumatoid factor, and nucleic antibodies. And the baby is at risk of neonatal lupus. That's a very important point. Then you have inflammatory joint pain. Okay. Then systemic sclerosis, there's two types. There's the diffuse type, <clears throat> which affects the whole body where there's skin thickening, collagen deposits, and then there's fibrosis. Okay, it's, uh, remember this color is common for all. Then you also have esophageal dysmotility. They will have recurrent vomiting because the food is not going down. And very importantly, they will have fibrosis of multiple organs, including the lungs, so what happens here is when there's lung interstitial fibrosis, the lung, there's going to be restrictions. Uh, in, it's a restrictive lung disease. And the patient, the words progressive, difficulty, breathing. This is a typical statement of lung interstitial fibrosis. If they say progressive difficulty breathing, one thing that should come to your head is lung interstitial fibrosis. Also, there's biliary cirrhosis because there's fibrosis. Renal crisis because the renal system gets, uh, there's going to be sclerosis in the renal system, in the arteries. And that can lead to acute renal failure and hypertension. This is called the renal crisis. Treatment is ACE inhibitors. Then in diffuse, you get these autoantibodies. And in limited, <coughs> you get anti-centromere antibody. This is something you need to remember. And the diffuse, uh, sorry, the limited type is associated with Crest syndrome. C for calcinosis cutis, where calcium deposits in under the skin. R for Raynaud's phenomenon, where usually if you blanch, there is no blanching, basically. Uh, within one to three seconds, sec the blood should come back. But in these patients, that does not happen. 
Then there's esophageal dysmorphility, that is E, sclerodactility, and T is telangiectasias. Why isn't the label there? Okay, I, I will send this image again. Finally, we have antiphospholipid syndrome. This is something, just remember it like this, recurrent blood clots. A patient who has SLE, or it could be a primary disorder also, they have recurrent blood clots and recurrent miscarriages. So basically, if these two are present, a patient will be suspected of having antiphospholipid syndrome and uh, they will be put on systemic anticoagulation, long-term anticoagulation with warfarin and all those drugs. And they have this increased PTT. Even if you give them plasma, even if you give them plasma, the PTT remains elevated. Then here are the autoantibodies. A very important point you need to know is when you do a syphilic uh, VDRL test, a syphilis test, it comes back positive, false positive. That means they don't have the disease, uh, they don't have syphilis, but it comes back positive. That's a very important association. So I basically uh, went through everything, like all the topics that we did uh, in around 30 minutes. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask because uh, once this meeting ends, I will send another link, you can join again. Guys, remember this, the best way to use this is to just uh, go through this maybe every uh, few days. It'll take you a maximum of three minutes to go through all of these. And it'll last in your memory for definitely for a few years. So when you go to study these subjects, it'll take you 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes to study the entire topic, okay? And uh, one more thing, if I put the words, et cetera, that means there's more, uh, which I didn't go to mention here, okay? I will end the meeting now. Uh, we'll start again with the questions. Will be done in uh, within 40 minutes maximum, okay? Uh, just reach out.